of sinful men. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. And it is the first Sunday of May. Can you believe how fast time has flown so far this year? Let's take a moment and turn to your neighbors and greet them and wish them a good morning. Our call to worship this morning is from chapter 3 in Ephesians, verses 10 through 13. It's page 1391 in the Pew Bible if you want to follow along. In order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places, this was in, was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. We ask, uh, or we thank Jesus and God for the reading of his word. And now we will go into our prayer. We'll start with personal prayer and then join together. I just have um, a couple of announcements for you, if you'd please keep them in mind. The first um, is that June Drzezinski's grandson is home. He's no longer overseas, so we're thankful for that. Please keep him in your prayers, though, as he continues his training um, and serving the United States. Uh, please pray for Fraser's friend, um, Al. Al is 96 years old, has lived a great life, has lots of family, and he is entering the transition into homegoing with the Lord, which could happen um, anytime. So please keep Al's family in your prayers, and Al, we celebrate his um, knowing Jesus Christ as his Savior. And um, that is all the prayers uh, I ask that you keep in mind today. So let's go together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day celebrating in your house of worship. And while it's outside, we have gloomy weather. Inside, we are filled with sunshine. And knowing that this next hour of worship together is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to the word that is shared today and we ask that you please be with those who are not with us today who are um, who are maybe studying the word at home or watching us on YouTube later this week we ask that you please share the same well-being well the feeling of um, celebratoriness that we we have today we ask that you please be with um, Jindrzynski's grandson Derek um, we welcome him home to the United States and we thank him for his service and we ask that you please continue to be with him as he serves and we ask that you make space at your side for Al as he prepares to join you in heaven. And we are thankful that he is aware that Jesus Christ is his savior and um, he knows that the best is coming for him. And we ask that you be with our country as we see on the news so many things that threaten to divide us. We ask that you bring us together instead and you fill hearts and minds with everybody's um, just basic human kindness. We ask that you, you spread that feeling amongst our youth and our leaders and um, guide them to decisions that put you first and um, 
and their own needs second. And we just thank you again for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Blessed Assurance. The hymn number is actually 444. So if you could please turn to that page, we will stand and sing together. 444. have a few announcements this morning. The first is that the elders and the deacons will be meeting today. So elders and deacons, if you could please exit to the side. Um, we'll be meeting after church. The second is that Bible study continues on Wednesdays. Um, Pastor has outlined for us what's going to take place from now until, I think it was the first week of June, Last week of June, thank you. Um, but this week, we're going to be studying Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 34. If you want to read and be prepared for our discussion um, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And my last announcement is that we are going, the fellowship committee, when I say we, fellowship committee is going to be doing a fundraising event at Texas Roadhouse on Tuesday, May 14th will receive 10% of the total food purchases from that evening. Um, you do need to show the flyer. We've got the physical forms that were in your bulletin. We've got the digital form that's on our Facebook page, or I can text it to you so you can share it uh, with friends and family. Um, you just need to show the flyer to your server that night. Uh, we are not allowed to pass the flyer around the night of. So. If you're, if you're going to share, please share um, ahead of time. Okay, those are all of my announcements. I'm going to ask our ushers if they would please come forward so we can give unto him our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. <laughs>
stand and sing our doxology together. Father, we thank you for these gifts that have been given, and we thank the givers who give them in your name. We ask that you guide us in accordance to your will and how best to use these funds, and we make decisions that are in your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 253, which is, I keep, just keep trusting my Lord. That's 453. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 through 22. It's on page 7 in the Pew Bible. That's Genesis uh, 6, 13 through 22. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, you shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it the length of the ark 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I, even I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Every th everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of the every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. And as for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. And the Lord grant his blessing upon the reading of his word. And next we have Lori is going to provide us for special music and she's going to be playing in Christ Alone.
Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground filled with fiercest drought and storm what What fears are stilled when striving cease? My comforter, my all in all. Here is the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God Babe, the gift of love in righteousness scored by the ones he came to save death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. The mercies forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. Thank you, Lori. Good morning, church. Feels a little empty in here compared to last week. Uh, but praise the Lord that he's going to fill these seats again, and the lost are going to come here, and they're going to be found by him, and 
they're going to stay with us and hang out with us. And it's going to be a wonderful day as we see those days in this church return. So one brief announcement that I have to add uh, to the list before we get into the word this morning. Uh, we have selected a move-in date for the parsonage. Um, so cancel your vacation plans because uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, go on vacation, please uh, enjoy it. Uh, our plan is that Saturday, May 25th, we're going to move all of our big stuff from Shemong over here. And uh, then it's the beginning of the end at that point, I guess. Um, we're getting ready this weekend to actually finally hang cabinets in the kitchen again. Uh, it, um, there's less holes in the wall today than there were just three, di three days ago. Um, we feel accomplished and incredibly sore, um, but we're almost there with most of the house. <laughs> Not quite with all of it yet. Uh, we still have some waterproofing adventures to do in the basement after we move in, but praise the Lord, we know some good people in some good places, and not only for the parsonage, but also for the water issues we have in the basement here, we have, we have had what should be enough product donated to the church to solve any water issues that we have. Uh, probably about two to three thousand dollars worth of product. Now it's going to take some manual labor on, on our part, so if anybody is comfortable working with some, a little bit of concrete, uh, you're certainly welcome to help when the time comes, but we're praising the Lord that what we thought was going to be multiple thousands of dollars, not only of product, but also of somebody's labor to come out and do this stuff. Uh, Courtney and I are fortunate to know trained professionals in the right avenue of work to be able to help us out with that, so we're rejoicing in that. Let's go ahead and read our passage again, and then we'll get into the word. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms, and you shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top. And set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which the breath of life from under heaven, everything that is on the earth, shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark, to keep them alive with you, they shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you and keep them alive. As for you, take, care for your, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for, which you, for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. Uh, that food also reminds me, one other note for our moving day, we, there will be food. Uh, either we'll do a barbecue, uh, so a combo moving day, Memorial Day weekend barbecue, or we'll at least order pizza. It's going to depend on A, how prepared we are ahead of time, and B, um, how much we honestly feel like doing that day. Uh, we're human, I'll just be perfectly honest with you. But anyway, so as you'll see in your bulletin, the title for today is crazy faith, because I don't know about you, but I read this story, I read what Noah is told, I read the instructions Noah is given, I read what's about to happen, and especially for the time Noah was alive, but even for us today, if this was a word for us today, it would just be absolutely insane to us. We would have a really hard time understanding what is about to happen. And we'll study a little bit deeper into the flood itself last week, but they didn't know what a flood was. So Noah's getting this warning. He's getting this instruction that makes no sense because what's about to happen makes no sense for reasons that probably also didn't make any sense. And even for us today, there's a lot in life that just doesn't make any sense. And we are simple human creatures created by an all-knowing God 
to be a some knowing people. Not everything has been revealed to us at this point. So when God outlines his plan for this is what I'm going to do, even if we feel like we understand it fully, we still don't understand it fully. And it requires, on our behalf, putting our faith and trust in God, having that full understanding as he lays this out. So I'm going to give you four things this morning that crazy faith requires. So if you are a note taker, you can write them down. If you're not a note taker, then I trust you have the best memory in the world. Uh, I'm not a good note taker, uh, so I usually just remember things or I forget them and I never think of them again. So however you go about this is up to you. But first thing that crazy faith requires is crazy faith requires believing what God said is coming. So verse 13, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. How do you think Noah felt the first time he heard those words? Because it's not until after this that he gives the instructions of what Noah will do. So the first shock to the system, he's saying to Noah, everything is going to end. So Noah's immediate thought may have been, okay, well, I guess I'm going down as well. Now, quickly, that's remedied by God giving him the instructions of, A, you're going to build this ark, and B, you're going to get onto it. But how do you think Noah responded to the coming destruction of all flesh on the earth? Really, the only thing that had a reasonable shot at surviving was anything already living in the water. Noah had more than just his family. He also probably had friends, people that he worked with, distant relatives. What do you think his response was? And we don't know because Scripture doesn't tell us. Maybe Noah's reaction was to, he wanted to tell everybody, hey, this is coming. How do you think the people would have responded to him with that message? It's about the same way people respond to us today when we give them that message, that the Lord is returning and that destruction for some is coming. Revelation 20, 11 through 15, I'll read it for you, says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. How do we respond to the coming destruction? Because there's going to come a day, as Revelation and several other pictures outline, where God is going to set in motion this plan about which all the things we know in heaven and on earth today will come to an end, and each and every person that lives and has ever lived will stand before the throne of God, the throne of Christ. It can be referred to as the Bema seat, the white judgment throne of Christ, and he is going to judge us based on whether or not our names are in the book of life. Now, it says in this verse here that there is a sea and that there is death in Hades. They're giving up the dead that they already have, which are those who are already perishing without God. And then death in Hades itself will be thrown into the lake of fire with those people who will be judged and thrown into the lake of fire as well. But this is a very real destruction coming to this earth. And there are people, and we've all started on this path, on this path towards destruction, where when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we are going to be separated by sheep and goats, the righteous and the unrighteous, the saved and the unsaved, the faithful and the unfaithful. And we are going to be sent either into eternity with Christ or eternity apart. Do we believe that this is coming? 
Now, every single one of us alive in here today has spent our entire lives waiting for this day to come. Whether we have actively thought about it or are actively waiting for it, our lives sit in wait for the day of Christ's return. For all those already in eternity, their lives sit in eternity awaiting the day of Christ's return. It is going to happen, it is inevitable, it is promised all throughout Scripture that this is what would happen. Is our faith crazy enough to believe it? And if our faith is crazy enough to believe it, are we crazy enough to go out and to share it? The world we live in today doesn't want a judgmental people in the church. And really, we should not be a judgmental people in the church. But Scripture also tells us to judge rightly with all things. That when we look at the world around us, we are to look at it through the lens of Scripture that says, this is not right. This is broken. Sin has infiltrated. This is not what God designed it to be. And when we see a lost and a dying world where people have not gotten off of that path of destruction, have not put their faith in Jesus, then our faith needs to be crazy enough to call out to those people and tell them that destruction is coming. The end of all flesh is near. That only those who have been given, who have responded to the root of salvation that we have been given will be saved from that destruction that is coming. Crazy faith requires believing what God said is coming. Next, crazy faith requires believing what we are called to do. So we're going to read a few verses back in our text. We're going to do 14 through 16 and then 18 through 21. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks, 18. But I will establish my covenant with you And you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, And gather it to yourself, and it shall be free food for you and for them. So there are a few instructions here that Noah is given. And they all they they get less ridiculous as time goes on, but they start fairly ridiculous. Do you know that the largest wooden ship ever made in recorded human history is 213 feet long? According to these measurements, the ark would have been about 450 feet long long. Our human engineering has not caught us up to the ark, except for the one that's sitting in Kentucky right now. If you haven't been, I have not either. My hope is to go one day. I don't think that thing is going to survive a flood necessarily. It might. Uh, I I hope we don't have to find out. Uh, God did promise he would not flood the earth again. 450 feet long. Now, Cruise ships today are cities on, cities on the sea. They're 1,000 feet long because steel can do different things than wood can. But twice the length of any other wooden boat in recorded human history that men have made. This was an absurd task, especially for one man and, his, and his, maybe his sons were helping him do it. We don't really know how long it took Noah to build the ark, but it took a a very long time. The rough estimate is about 100 years old because we're right around Noah being 500 here, and then we're right around Noah being 600 when the flood starts. So somewhere in between that 100 years was the time it took to build this ark. So instruction number one, build the ark. Number two, gather the animals. Well, we remember in the garden, all the animals are coming to Adam, and he's naming them one by one. 
And there was this harmony that existed in the garden where Adam was not the food for the lions. So he was okay. We have a different dynamic at this point in history where if you come up against a predator, they're going to do what nature calls them to do. So next absurd instruction that Noah is given is bring the animals into the ark. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. From all over the world. Now, there were less animals then than there are today because, you know, as years have gone on, different species come together, create a new species. It's, it's happened. So the boat, while being a ridiculous size, would not have to carry all of today's animals, but the animals and creatures of that day. So yeah, bring in all the animals, the ones that you like to eat and the ones that like to eat you. Next instruction, enter the ark. So at this point, you know, you get through these first few verses and no one doesn't know what's happening to him just yet. He just knows he's going to build this giant boat and he's going to bring animals onto it. And then he says to enter the ark, to bring your family. So now no one knows, okay, well, I'm going to be saved. And there's, it notes here very briefly in 18 that God is going to establish his covenant with Noah, which we'll read in a couple chapters, uh, which will only take us a couple weeks to get there. But the last one that stands out to me the most is bring, bring some food. He's got to bring food for himself, his family, and the animals. He doesn't know how long he's going to be on the boat. Now, when you get into the flood account, it does say how long the rain was going to come. But at no point does God say, this is how long you're going to be on the ark. This is how long you need to prepare for. He doesn't give him those clear and easy instructions. And when you take the whole story together, they're on the ark for about a year. Because, yeah, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but it took six months, just about, about five, five to six months, before the boat settled itself on a mountain, and it took months after that before the water got low enough for them to exit. So about a year in total, they are on this ark. Now, last Sunday was a wonderful time. With that meal, food was prepared for about 120 people, and it was gone in that one day. Even if it were just for the eight people, quick math says you got about two to three weeks of that food, making it through, even if it stayed good for that long. Multiply what we had last week by another 15 times, and you need at least that much food to bring with you. And that's just for the eight people. Forget the animals who have much different and much bigger diets. So Noah has to follow this command without having all the information, at least as far as what Scripture tells us. Maybe there was more detail here that Moses did not add into the text. But as far as we can see is Noah has to trust in God's direction without having all the information before him. Bring food. Okay, how much? Enough. Okay, that's helpful information. So the question for us today is can we trust God enough to go where he calls us without knowing why he is calling us? without knowing all that we would take on. You know, there are global missionaries that often sign up for a period of time, but when they go, they really don't know how long they are going for. They just don't. At our last church, there was a missionary we had who would go serve in, uh, we were only allowed to say Southeast Asia because you weren't allowed to know that they served in India. They don't anymore because in India you do have to hide. She tried to go again during COVID, and she gets there with this great plan of the next couple years and what they're going to hold. And then, I don't know if you know this, but COVID was real, real bad in India because they are so horrifically densely populated, and the quality of living over there is already so bad that it just hit a lot harder than most other places. The country shut down, and she was sent home. And now she doesn't serve in India anymore. But she went there with this plan. God said, go. She went. And then immediately it was all thrown out the window. Well, why? Because God had different plans. But had she known all the details of that plan, 
she probably wouldn't have gone, which could have meant one of two things. Either maybe God didn't need her for those few days that she was back there, or she would have been disobedient to not go. Remember what happened to Jonah. God said, go to Nineveh and share the gospel with them. Jonah decided, I've got a better idea. And then he camped out in the belly of a giant fish for a few days. He didn't have all the details, but he decided rather than go and be obedient, he would not go because he didn't know what was going to happen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. You know what I love about that verse? It doesn't tell you what's on the path. It simply tells you that it's taking you in the right direction. It's taking you straight. That doesn't mean there aren't valleys. It doesn't mean there aren't mountains. It doesn't mean there aren't places where you're going to stub your toe. All the information you have here when you trust in the Lord is that he was going to lead you towards him. He doesn't tell you what's on the road the whole way there. So can we trust him on the straight path without knowing what bumps in the road there are going to be? Noah didn't know what this whole story was going to look like. He knew the earth was going to be destroyed. He knew he was supposed to build a boat, gather the animals, bring his family on there, and bring enough food for however long it was going to be without knowing however long it was going to be. But Noah trusted. And if we believe that the flood account is true, the whole reason we are here today is because Noah trusted. So crazy faith requires believing what we are called to do. Next, crazy faith requires believing that the impossible can happen. Verse 17, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. You want to know how many floods Noah had probably seen in his day before this? You want to know how much rain the earth had probably seen before this? The answer is almost certainly zero to both of those questions. And we'll get a little bit more into the, to the possible science of that next week when we study the actual flood itself. But simple fact is, it's very likely that this time in earth didn't need rain. It wasn't necessary Every, the earth was built perfectly for all life to flourish. There's a reason that we have evidence of creatures and plants at one point being bigger a long time ago than they are now because the earth prior to the flood was such a perfect ecosystem that life was able to flourish more and more. There are some people that believe that life on earth could have been as many as 100 billion people prior to the flood. You know, one, everybody lived to close to a millennium. So that was a long time to be able to be fruitful and multiply. Two, sickness wasn't the same then as it is today. I'd be willing to bet all these people lived without allergies. Just fine. We're, here we are in poly, pollen season, and half of you are either choking on the pollen or you're drugged up enough to not feel it. <laughs> this world was perfectly made and then the flood came and it changed but the flood was impossible it ne there was never a flood there was never rain what in the world even was rain for some people you hear about the new technology today and you're like what how in the world does that even work well, like what i still don't understand how bluetooth works I don't understand how wireless telephone works. It makes no sense to me. I trust that they work because I've used them. But these people, when they heard about rain, they had no idea what that could have been. And again, we don't know if Noah is going out and telling people, and everybody's like, what in the world are you even talking about? That's nonsense. That doesn't make sense. That can't be real. Well, God is the God of the impossible. He is the God of making the impossible possible. Genesis 18, which I know you're really all excited to get there in our study in Genesis in a couple years or so. But 
when Abraham is given this promise of, you're going to have a child, Sarah laughs. She thinks it's a joke because she's 90-some years old at this point. She's like, that's not possible. And God responds, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Mark 10, 27, those of you who have been in Bible study, we just discussed this not too long ago. With people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Crazy faith requires that we believe in the impossible, because our God is not limited by what we think is impossible. We are limited, but He is not. So when we hear about all these crazy things that might happen, when we hope and we pray for what seems impossible for the days ahead, whatever it may look like, we believe in a God that can do it. No limits. Finally, crazy faith requires believing that it's all true. Verse 22. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. All these things that seemed absurd, that seemed impossible, nearly a hundred years to build a boat. You know, Abraham, when he was first given that promise that he would have a son, 25 years go by before that promise is realized. 25 years And when you read the account of Abraham, you see the moments of doubt. You see the moments where they try and circle around God's plan because they don't know the when, they only know the what, and they try to get around it. But Noah here, all these absurd things that he did, a hundred years trying to build a boat, How many times do you think he doubted that the flood was actually coming? How many times do you think he doubted that rain was actually a thing? How many times did the people come along asking him what he was doing? Because you know to build a 450-foot long boat, you need a lot of space to do it. He wasn't going to hide it. How many people came along and belittled him for doing it? How many times did he have to defend himself and say, The Lord told me to do it. Destruction is coming. And this is my escape. If we believe that what the Bible says is true, then like Noah, we respond in obedience to what we are told, what we are given to do, and we open our eyes to see the Lord do his work. Because what was Noah given? He is given a message of destruction. That's how we started this passage. A means of salvation, the ark that would save him and his family. And he's given the faith to place his trust in the Lord for salvation. Noah did all that was commanded him. What are we given today? We are given a message of destruction. Now, with our message of destruction comes a great, great, great deal of hope and joy. But this world is headed down the path of destruction. And it has been given to us to go share the path of hope with others. We are given a means of salvation. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that all of our sins could be forgiven as we place our faith in Him and repent of our sins. And we've been given the faith to place our trust in the Lord for salvation. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If we believe that, then we trust it, and we have the crazy faith to see each and every step of the way to get there. And our faith needs to be crazy enough to share that with other people as well. To trust, we talked about this a bit on Wednesday night, a poor gospel witness is one that's afraid of the consequences of what he might say. And instead of saying what he should say, avoids the truth altogether. If we are afraid that people are going to like us less, if we are afraid that people are going to look at the absurdity of the boat that we are building to escape. If people are going to look at what we give up in our lives for the sake of knowing and following Christ, there are going to be consequences to sharing the truth. But the consequences for them, if they don't know it, are far greater 
than the consequences for us if we preach and proclaim the good news of the gospel. For us as a church, I'll close with this. In a lot of ways, we are walking together forward into days that are unknown. We don't know what the Lord has in store for us for the next 130 years of this church. We don't know how all those things are going to play out. We don't know every single little detail of his plan. We simply know that he calls us to go, to move forward, to share the gospel, to open our doors and to welcome in the lost that they might be found. We walk together into unknown, but we take each step into that unknown, fully knowing that God is before us, beside us, and within us in each and every step. And it's, it might take us some crazy faith to get there, for some more than others, right? Not just in what we believe and how we communicate what we believe, but how we put that belief on display. But we're not called to trust in what we are asked to do. We are called to trust in the one who asks us to do it. I'm sure Noah had a hard time believing that this boat was the right way. I'm sure Noah probably had better ideas. Idea number one, hey, what if you just didn't flood the earth? I'm sure Noah thought it was probably pretty crazy to gather all these animals together. I'm pretty sure Noah probably thought it was crazy to leave some of his family members behind and to only bring his sons and their wives and his wife onto the boat with him. He may have had a hard time trusting what he was called to do, but his trust was in the one who called him to do it. That's where our trust needs to be. The actions of our faith may seem crazy, but the author of our faith is the surest foundation. So let's have crazy faith. Let's be bold. Let's be brave. Let's trust in the absurd. And let's see God work mighty miracles each and every day in our lives and the lives of others around us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, Lord. We thank you for the precious treasure that is hidden within, Lord. Lord, we we thank you that we can take these truths from thousands of years ago, Lord, and apply to our lives today as it encourages us to press on and persevere. Lord, would you help us to trust in you? Even if we don't have all the information, even if what you are asking us to do may seem ridiculous to us, Lord, help us to trust in you and to trust that you know all that is happening and that it is all for our good, but most important of all, as we live out our purpose, for your glory. Lord, as we prepare our hearts to enter into a time of communion, Lord, would you just help us to settle our souls? Would you help us to calm ourselves before you, Lord, to trust in you as our Savior, to lean on you when we just can't do it anymore, Lord. May you fill our hearts and our spirits anew with your spirit, Lord. May we step into newness of life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we enter into communion, we'll take our fellowship offering. So if I can have a couple ushers come forward.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts that you have given us, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have allowed us to set these gifts aside to be able to help those who are in need, Lord, both in our church and in our community. We pray that you would help to guide us into the, the best way to use these funds to not only help people with their physical needs, Lord, but to be able to step in and help with their spiritual needs as well. We lift these gifts up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So now we are going to go into our time of communion. If you were here for uh, Good Friday, we're having quite the adventure with communion as we make some adjustments and everything. Uh, so if you prefer the prepackaged communion, there is a plate in the back if you didn't get one on your way in. But otherwise, we are we're back to communion that tastes far less like styrofoam, which is which is wonderful. You know, it's about us remembering what the Lord has done first and foremost. But it's also nice when the taste of it does not distract us from that as well. Here's what Paul writes in First Corinthians: For I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus Christ on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me so the way this process is going to work is we're going to pass the bread we're going to pray and we're going to take the bread together and then we will pass the cup pray and take the cup together but as always before we go to communion there is always this reminder from Paul therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in doing so he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. So, as always, if you do not know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then communion is not for you. It's not a matter of exclusion. It's a matter of we would not want to see you drink the judgment upon yourself that is the wrath of God awaiting you at the end of your days here. We want to enter into the joy of the Lord together, and when we take communion, it is us remembering together collectively that we have entered into that covenant with Christ. And when we take the bread and we drink the cup, we proclaim the truth that he died for our sins and that he rose again and ascended to the Father. And if it's not true for you, then you're not remembering truth as you do this, but simply drinking judgment upon yourself. So now we will pass the bread.
Jeff will pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you today. We take this symbol of your body. And Father, we just give praise that you saw fit to sacrifice your son in our behalf for the shedding of the sins that we have from us and him taking them all on himself. Again, Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory in all ways. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. Now we'll pass the cup. Most Holy Father, as we are about to partake in your precious blood shed for us as a symbol here of uh, grape juice. Father, again, we just give you praise, honor, and glory for all that you did up there in sending your precious Son for this purpose. And it's in his precious name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we remember that he is indeed coming. Let's stand together. And sing our final hymn, Trust and Obey, number 451.
Do you trust him this morning? Even if he asks what seems to be the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard in your entire life, do you trust him this morning? If he asks you to leave all your riches behind like the rich young ruler, do you trust him enough to leave all that behind? If he asks you to leave behind everything that has kept you comfortable, do you trust him enough to be uncomfortable? Do we trust him enough to obey? I leave you with the words that Paul closes his second letter to the Corinthians with. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. See you next week.